Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you'd get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Drew Meredith, welcome to this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast. Thank you. Today, we're talking about seven companies. Why seven and not 10? Well, because we didn't coordinate before we hit record <laughs> and we both ended up covering a few of the same companies. So we're going to cover CSL, Seek, Vicinity, Redbubble, Challenger, BHP. Uh, I've got Car Sales and I've got, is that it? Is that on my list? I think that's all on my list. Yeah, because I did CSL, Redbubble and Seek as well. So. Maybe a quick comment on Brambles as well. Quick comment on Brambles. There you are. So 7.5 companies today is what we're covering. <laughs> um, rather than kind of dwell on it, uh, it's been a pretty volatile week. We've seen a kind of mixed bag of results. Uh, companies, you know, pretty typical for reporting season, falling 5 10% either side. Redbubble being the exception to that, falling over 30% uh, upon release of its results. Uh, so a lot of eyes looking at that one there. Mate, why don't we start with the, I guess, the probably the most popular company amongst this list, which is CSL, uh, given its sheer size. Maybe if you share what you thought and then I'll share what I thought about the company's results. Yeah, I mean, it was sold down, I think, 2 or 3%. The market managed to overcome, I think, sick, second biggest company on the ASX. So, everything it does drives the market. Uh, sold down after profit fell two to 5% to $2.3 billion US. Mm -hmm. It was interesting that management were pretty quick to indicate that that was actually the second biggest profit in the history of CSL since it was floated in 1992, I think. So, kind of impressive in that regard. Uh, I think the issues for this year were kind of well appreciated. That's why the share price didn't move all that much. Uh, and that was, so CSL does blood treatments, immunology, and in order to do blood treatments, you need to acquire blood and, yep. and pay for blood. So that's blood donors all over the US, Australia. Uh, part of it, I know there were issues on around the Mexican border where they were struggling to get uh, donations. Um, and that's very much a leading uh, 12 months ahead. So you need blood before you can use that and treat and, and, you know, blend that to make treatments. So 12 months ago, they were struggling for volumes and now they've had a surge in volume, something like 24% in 2022, which bodes well for next year. And mm. that's what management said, I think. Mm. Yeah. Um, would you consider CSL growth stock? Yes. You would? Yes. Interesting. What? Okay. So, okay. Well, how do you define growth stock? Well, it's loosely. returning to growth. One, I mean, most people look at the PE and say it's always, it's on a high PE compared to the market. I think it's like I, 41 times or something. And I still probably think it's cheap. Um, wow. <laughs> bold. Here we go. I mean, a, a big part of the, uh, <laughs> I mean, CSL is a company that's always been expensive. It's always been expensive. We're yeah. trying to manage portfolios and the hardest stock to buy, everyone's held it at some stage and they've, there was a point last year where anyone who bought CSL ever was in a profit. Uh, I think there's only a small portion of people that aren't in a profit on CSL at the moment. Well, it must mm -hmm. be about 280, 290 today. Mm -hmm. um, I think whilst revenue only grew 2.9% and profit fell, you're looking at a company that invests 11% of revenue every year into R&D and that on its own should set it up to being a growth stock versus a income or a value stock. Yeah, I think in the context of Australia, it's definitely like in terms of blue chips, it's definitely on the growth year end. How about though, if you compared it to say one of the big, I'm just trying to get up the data and ticker, one of the like US tech stocks um, that might also invest 15%. Um, they trade on much lower PEs too, don't they? Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. So, um, because CSL, you know, it's an international business as well. So that's like, so Google's, uh, well, Alphabet's price to earnings ratio is 22. Uh, and I think it invests about 15% back in R&D. Um, but interestingly, right, so I'm just looking at the normalized earnings per share as, as for the PE ratio trailing. Um, it actually it looks like it averaged over 40 times um, 
earnings during COVID all the way back to say the beginning of late 2019. Yeah. And recently on a normalized basis, it's more like 36 times earnings. But if we go for the 2010s period, it was trading anywhere between 20 and 30 times all the time. Yeah. So yeah, always at the higher end because the the ASX's average is around about 15 or 16. And PE is something that uh, penalizes companies that are doing R&D as well because your earnings are cut by the R&D that you're making. So if you, the more you invest into yourself, you kind of penalize on a valuation basis. So Mm. if- there's a few reports that have backed that out um, and you know, found it never actually trades that expensively. Mm. And if they grow at 9% like they're predicting next year, well, that's going to be significantly better than most parts. I think the ASX either is expected to shrink over the next 12 months or potentially grow at 2 to 3%. So three mm. times system would be good. So just to throw some figures out, um, two dollars twenty-two in dividends, a one dollar eighteen final dividend, which is the same as last year. It's ten percent franked, um, but it's up if you adjust for currency. So they were quick to point that out. Equal to the original purchase price of CSL shares. If- is that what it was? <laughs> I think it's two dollars a share. Oh right, okay, wow. Well. Um, when did it IPO? It was like early nineties. Nineteen ninety-two. Yeah. Um, so revenue up two percent, uh, profit down five percent. Interestingly, over the past five years, the company has KGAR its top line, so compound annual growth rate, meaning growth on growth every year of 11%. Um, in that time, we've had some acquisitions. Now, see, here's my problem with CSL. I'm just <laughs> so not, is, is 11% KGAR not growth? It is good growth. Yeah. <laughs> However, that's just the top line. We've also got to consider that um, in that time, the company has actually taken on a bit of debt. Uh, so it's kept, kept its dividend, but it's taken on a bit of debt and it's made more acquisitions than it have previously necessarily like bigger acquisitions like the most recent one um i can't remember the exact price it was a six and a half billion is what they ended up paying. v4 yeah or v4 yeah um the uh, swiss company yeah, yeah. um m- moves it into a kind of an adjacency which says they want to go in as part of their 2030 strategy but um i don't know more acquisitions can it maintain that like i guess my question is like what's 150 billion dollar companies from around figures i don't have it in front of me um can it maintain that growth and therefore demand the same type of p ratio or should it be coming down now i don't know that's my question maybe something we can throw out there another answer um <laughs> i think r and d is going to be more important than the acquisition when I, they talked about that acquisition and saying that the company they bought wasn't as good at commercializing product as csl so it's not just the uh, you know the revenue and the potential of that business, but actually the the drugs and the R and D that they've been working on, yeah. and how you scale that. So you look at the flu vaccine business, which was an acquis- a bad acquisition at the time. It took three or four years mm. to uh, st- what do you stomach or process, and that that grew fifteen percent over the last you know twelve months. And obviously, the market for flu vaccines has never been more important um, and never been more relevant. So. I yeah, think point. it's always going to gobble things up uh, naturally. And uh, the companies like this, I mean, the best quote from, I think, the CEO was, we can't progress a sustainable growth, growth strategy without investment in R&D. If we're not innovating, we manage our exit from the business. So <laughs> <laughs> it's, you, it's kind of refreshing in, in Australia where everyone basically pays out dividends and a company is just com- committed completely to growth. Yeah, that's fair. Um, so I got asked this last night on uh, Self Wealth. Self Wealth is a sponsor of the show. Fantastic to have them. Um, so last night I got asked. Someone said to me they've. I think they're buying div- BHP for dividends and CSL for growth. And I was like, I'd probably buy something else for growth to be honest. Like rather than just straight up CSL, um, because I don't know. I just feel like there's other companies that can compound faster if growth is the key thing. But that said, I take totally take your point for a blue chip company, super wide moat compounding you know the top line at 10 or 11 percent if you can get some operating leverage in there too healthcare isn't going away blood plasma <laughs> donations yeah COVID impacted it but that's not going away so uh fair points and snake bites they aren't going away people are still walking through the bush and they need their <laughs> anti-venom you're not so- going to get 30 percent jumps like a yeah. like a car sales or something like that is probably wary on csl yeah and it's also hit more by macro events as well so Yep. Majority of their income comes from US US dollar earnings. So there's a con- currency conversion back to Australia. And then if there's a you know bond yield um, increase in the bond yield, well, CSL is generally sold off on a macro view. Mm. The company did end the year with a bucket load of cash on its balance sheet. If you're wondering how that got there, it's from the capital raising and it's just the timing difference. So the company does have a bit of debt. Um, but 
yeah, a lot of that, I think it was like 11 billion from memory, um, was shown on the balance sheet. But yeah, uh, $10.4 billion of cash. But that was to pay for the acquisition that then settled in August. So, um, well, most of it did anyway. So, what would you, if you were, to, if you were grading CSL's result, what would you give it? Like A, B, C, D, fail? Pass. What's pass? D. D, D to C. D, D yeah. to C. Yeah. Okay. Because it was a pretty tough year. Um, yeah. Lapping COVID and uh, what have you. So, okay, yeah, good. I'd probably give it, yeah, like a C plus. So, I think it's pretty good. And I think, you know, you and I doing this one podcast, we're not going to convince someone that's held the stock for 10 or 20 <laughs> years to go and sell because we're worried about a little bit less growth. Like you said before, compounding, um, if you've held it for a very long time, those dividends are very, very juicy. So, definitely, why not? Um, interesting fact about COVID, um, because I get started giving blood for the first time, like regularly during COVID through the Red Cross. And um, I faint every time I get blood. So really? <laughs> it's been a struggle for me. <laughs> well, okay, I probably wouldn't do it then. Um, but yeah, so when I, because during lockdowns here in Victoria, it was very hard to get out, right? So when I was in there, the nurses would tell me that they'd have regulars that were coming in during COVID because blood plasma you can give more frequently than actual bloods. And they were saying they'd get a lot of young. Uh, ladies come in to give blood <laughs> and they would use it as an occasion to catch up with their friends because they could have coffee and the, the free biscuits. Cookie. Yeah, the cookies and stuff after the donation because they couldn't meet up any other way. So Is that why you were going get, there as well? That's why, exactly why I, why I was going in there, yeah. The to cookies meet up with, or the, the young ladies? So yeah. Young ladies, yeah. It's a chance to meet young ladies. No, it, but it's seriously like it was a great initiative and because I, I was worried. The reason that I gave blood was because I thought, well, no one's going to be going. Yeah, I better do something. I'm just sitting there. But they said, no, it's the opposite, actually. We've been inundated. So, And we don't pay in Australia either, do we? No. Nah. No. Nah. Nah, Only in kind. Biscuits. Yeah. Good biscuits, though. And you get some chocolate milk <laughs> Party if you want. sometimes. Go and do it. Great. It's a great thing to do. Um, so, yeah. So, that's a CSL. Good result. Um, the a big Australian, which is BHP, um, good result from BHP. In fact, probably some people would say tremendous. And the reason why I say that is they paid a humongous dividend. Um, dividends up 8%. This is full year dividends up 8% to $3.25 a share, equivalent to $4.72. Just based on the current share price, that's a dividend yield of 11% fully franked. So maybe like 14% after franking credits. They also gave the distribution of the Woodside um, when they sold, so when they sold their oil and gas across the Woodside Group. Yeah. Interestingly, um, again last night when I was on the live show, I asked some people, you know, have you invested in the company? Blah blah blah. blah. Some people got in in the teens with BHP a few years ago, and some people invested in the early, like the early twenties um, or the low twenties, I should say. And so their dividend yield was equivalent to twenty five percent of their cost base, and that's yeah. only a few years down the track. So what a reversal commodities have had. And massive profits and massive dividends from the likes of BHP and Rio. I don't know um, if you looked at the result, but I think I'm old enough to remember the progressive dividend policy. Oh yeah, and that got cut. Uh, that a few was years ago. that was I think when the share price fell into the teens. So that was the idea. I think they were trying to be a dividend aristocrat, which yep. was every year the dividend was going to increase, even if it was at a fifty percent payout. So to see it recover and go beyond that kind of talks to how well the company's been managed and also the support of commodity prices this year. Yeah, um, they obviously. Uh, for those of you that don't follow the stock market that closely, uh, BHP made a, a pitch for Oz Minerals, who shot it down pretty quickly. Um, that was for a copper play. So BHP offloaded its oil and gas to try and simplify its business. And for the most part, it's been a very strong kind of five years for BHP. Um, I remember Scott Phillips, when I was at the Molly Fool, said that uh, if he was ever going to buy BHP, now is the time. And I remember that because he's the type of guy that wouldn't ever invest in that type of thing. And uh, I just think... Yeah, that was a pretty good call from him. Um, the companies, you know, are continuing. So they've got continuing results and discontinued operations, which have all been restated fine. Um, but uh, profit from continuing operations up 34% to $29 US billion. Um, continuing EBITDA up 16% to $41 billion. Revenue up 14% to $65 billion. If you take total revenue, it was 71.5. So, um, yeah, pretty impressive business. Throughout all of this, they've also managed to reduce their net debt to uh, $333 million, which is pretty much, I mean, that's net of cash, but that's pretty much nothing for a company of BHP size. Um, enters 2023, quote, in great shape strategically, operationally, and financially, end quote. So 
Yeah, how, I mean, how much came from how much earnings came from iron ore? I don't know exactly. That's I don't have the segment, or, still. segment report right in front of me, but I do know I do have the volumes in front of me. And so um, volumes for iron ore were flat year over year. Copper was down four percent. Coal was down nine percent. Uh, energy coal down four percent, and nickel down fourteen percent. So volumes mostly flat, but it was that expansion in price yeah. that we saw from commodities over the last year. Um, it was probably a great time. You know, I think we'll look back in one or two years and say, what a great time it was to offload the oil and gas business. Yeah, yeah. They've been looking at trying to do things with that for a while. And so, you know, prices were high, as we know, for energy. So, a good time to offload that. Um, simpler business. I probably still prefer it as an exposure to resources than Rio, just because Rio is very oh, iron ore heavy. Yeah, yeah. Um, at least BHP has quite a few other things in the irons in the fire. One of those things being the, the potash, the Janssen project, which is a massive Canadian a potash project used in fertilizer. Yeah, and they're kind of positioning themselves as this future minerals company, now, even though majority still comes from iron ore and they sell coal. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but they're, they're definitely, the copper move is all about getting involved in the battery supply chain. And the one thing you always know with BHP, if they ever do the opposite, sell them straight away, is mm. that they'll only buy the highest quality and lowest cost producing assets. And they, it, can, yeah. and they can do it because they're so big and diversified, cashed up. It's a license to print money, essentially. Yeah. Yep, as long as they, you know, make good with the kind of the communities and the governments that wherever they're operating, um, which they normally do pretty well, uh, you can, yeah, basically you can just print money, dig dig stuff out of the ground, annuity like revenue, and then when prices falter, uh, you can buy the stock and they'll typically buy another mine that's already been built and paid for by someone else's pocket. So. And have the infrastructure to, to get it all to market. I think something there, you know, iron ore cost is something like $15, $20 a tonne. Yeah. And the price is obviously over yeah, 100 bucks. So you yeah, can imagine. 100 bucks. doesn't yeah. matter what the price is. They'll always pump out cash flow, but I'd always be wary of that 11% yeah, yield. I, oh, yeah. It's a yield trap. Just full, full, full disclosure, <laughs> it's a yield trap because um, forecast dividends are expected to come down uh, considerably over the next two years, whether or not that, that analysts are correct. But it, it yeah. So- well done. Thank you for picking me up on that. Um, <laughs> definite yield trap. Beware. Um, you can get exposure to BHP, CSL, and all the others by buying the the index, just so you know. Um, if you want to deflect some of that kind of yield trap bias, you can buy the VHY ETF, which is a dividend ETF that we've talked about on the show. Um, yeah, because you still get 10% or more to BHP as part of that because it's so massive. Yeah. It's a huge part of the index. So, um, yeah, I think BHP in terms of scores, um, I would give it a, like a – it's a good result. So, like an A. Um, just expect some softness going forward. Maybe we can do another company that we overlap on before we get to vicinity. Um, why don't we talk about Seek, mate? Um, Seek, the Australian jobs portal website, kind of expanding throughout Asia, Latin America – yeah, they, were, they were pretty aggressive. So we use LinkedIn quite a lot. And I where I was reading through the announcement last night and they talked a lot about the competition with LinkedIn. Yeah. And they were very clear to say that, you know, we only do jobs at Seek. We don't use your data <laughs> <laughs> and sell your data and advertise to you and do all kinds of other things like LinkedIn. So that was kind of a very interesting uh, message <laughs> I took away from the from the annual report. Do you, think, um, do you think LinkedIn's got better or worse since Microsoft bought them out? I think it's got better, um, uh, yeah. definitely better integration, better usage, uh, the use of that data. I mean, most of these tech companies have become advertising platforms, yeah. essentially. So well, they all end up in advertisers, don't we, at the end of the day? Exactly. Yeah, Tracking so. you everywhere on the internet. But it is definitely very useful um, and a great source of news. You know, professionals probably moved away from the likes of Facebook, which is struggling at the moment, towards things like LinkedIn, where you can get a great deal of relevant news now, too. Mm. Um, but Seek, so we... For backstory, we bought this in the worst of the pandemic and then yeah, yeah, that, yeah. probably sold it a bit early. So we probably, I think we doubled our money or so for clients on the investment and then sold it a bit early when we thought valuation getting a bit too far. Didn't predict the, how tight the labor market would be and how good that would be for Seek. Yep. But with the tech sell-off, we're probably back where we sold it. So we're not, <laughs> not as comfortable at the moment. That was a great result though. Um, was it revenue was up 46%, profit up, you know, 150%. So that, that tells you that they've got operating uh, leverage. Yep. Um, and they're expecting another 10% growth next year. Uh, a lot of the headline, or most importantly, the dividend was up 10%, which yeah. it's kind of the, what they split their company about two years ago into the Seek Growth. So that's the venture capital investments that's run by the, I think it's Andrew Bassett, 
Sander, isn't it? Not Paul. Yeah, I always get confused. Yeah, yeah I should know off the top of my head, but I, yeah, I always get confused. And then the ex CBA CEO yeah. in Narev yeah. runs the, the Seek business in a t shirt. If, yeah. if you notice that in the photos, yeah, now. right. So, okay, I haven't checked that out. Suit and tie to the a t yeah. uh, Like us. Looks yeah, so. well, that's yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> one of us. Uh, this is me overdressed yeah. in a shirt. <laughs> Full disclosure, I wear a hoodie to the office. <laughs> it was, uh, I think the interesting story there was they split it into two businesses and they're kind of like CSL where they're investing for the future and trying to back the new seeks in different parts Which of the world. Which I've done a good job at because yeah. one of the bats had some, I'm just going to throw this out there, um, the Square Peg Capital, yeah. the VC, which one of the, the bigger VC um, names here in Australia. Definitely. Yeah. So, they've got pedigree for it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, that's where a lot of the attention was in the media, was this idea that their VC portfolio was technically worth two and a half billion, but they actually devalued it by yeah, did, a, yeah. a quarter or so on concerns. They said significant valuation declines uh, and there was a disconnect between private and public valuations. And if you've been reading the newspapers, you know, there's a lot of talk about this with industry super funds, it institutional starts. investors, <laughs> yeah. Canva is in particular in the middle of it at the moment. So that was interesting that they cut that by 20%. Um, and that was probably, an, you know, that's an impact on your, not your underlying, pro not your underlying profit, your, your statutory profit, but yeah. not on your, your actual, cash flow. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, it was super impressive, I thought. Yeah, I think it's a tremendous result. Um, just circling back to that public be private, I saw a, some comments via a, a chief investment officer of an industry, was industry super fund, um, CIO, basically saying no one cares about unlisted assets. No one cares. Our members don't care if we report it or not. <laughs> Anyway, um, but I'll always you yeah. always say there, but that means if you redeem before they revalue something down, well, you've got greater value than the person. You can go buy it back. And yeah, that's it. Wait for it to fall. There's an arbitrage. Swap out. <laughs> yeah, I think we we're saying that during COVID. Have you seen? I'm just going to turn this to you, um, and this is not good podcasting. I'm just going to show you the chart of job vacancies. Have you yeah. seen that? It's insane. So the number of job vacancies in Australia at a, not just a record, but like bef like pre COVID, this would have been like two and a half times the record of job vacancies in Australia right now. Yeah. And I'm hearing this everywhere and everyone that I speak to, people saying, yeah, we can't find anyone. We've had to shut down the shop. Like there's a cafe that I used to go to in Hawthorne. There's a big sign on the window that says, there's a, I have a couple of cafes and it says, we are not open because we do not have enough staff. Please go to our other cafe. I was in Noosa last week and there was the same problem up there. So yeah. they wouldn't open on some nights because they just couldn't get be. enough staff for it. Yeah. I was um, telling the story last night. I was um, at the Dorovich, the pathology. And there's three in my area, and I was talking to the ladies in there. I'm like, yeah, no, the other two just you most days of the week talking don't open. to ladies at healthcare. Just, <laughs> what can I say? It's the best place to go. Um, so, no, but I was chatting to them, and they were saying, yeah, the other uh, clinics for the last week have had like five days where they just won't open because they just yeah. can't get people. Yeah. So um, they ended up just being inundated in their clinic. But um, yeah, anyway, job vacancy is at record highs, so you would expect Seek to perform well. They had record job ads in March, they said. Yeah, right. Okay. In March, right. So, that's not too long ago at all. Um, obviously, the big concern, because Seek shares are down, um, the big concern amongst investors is how bad does it get from here? Yeah. Like, what happens in 2023? Now, their guidance, I thought it was pretty robust, but there was some criticism thrown out. Like, their guidance is growth, you know, excluding some significant items. Their guidance is for growth. So, I thought it was pretty, I thought it was decent. I didn't think there was anything bad about the outlook. What did you make of it? The quote was, we have assumed a low risk of job market volatility from monetary policy, geopolitical change and the pandemic. And yeah. <laughs> that's a lot of assumptions yeah, it is. that everything will be fine. If this assumption changes, revenue could fall below guidance. So, I think they're assuming Goldilocks and that's probably what, what the market didn't like. Yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm pretty opinionated on the jobs position and, and you look- Overseas, the US has only just got to the same amount of people employed as there were before the pandemic. So, mm -hmm. unemployment's the f unemployment rates have, but there's less people working, and you can see that in Australia, unemployment's at near an all-time low. But there's about the same people working as there were in 2019. So, a, a big part of that's I think immigration and overseas workers no longer coming into the country, at least at the moment. Mm. Um, how else do you have the same amount of job vacancies as unemployed? There's a mismatch in. True. In skills. Good point. Yeah, good point. You, that was a bit um, too macro probably though. No, no, no. You're digging into the data. <laughs> I like it. I didn't, I didn't, um, I'm not across it as well as you are, uh, but that makes sense. And that would probably be the, the rhetoric from everywhere, right? Like even jobs, you know, in transport and things like that, which are like for the most part, blue collar jobs pay really well, but blue collar jobs, um, oftentimes they can be fulfilled 
Um, like I was in a region, Wangaratta not long ago, which I know you know well. Um, <laughs> and the transport sector up there is really hustle and bustle because it's on the border between Vic, Vic and New South Wales. And they can't get, you know, they say in all the, the people that can drive a truck are going to drive trucks, which means that people that were driving buses aren't driving buses anymore. Because you get paid more driving yeah, a truck. And yeah, and some of the people that were doing that are now working on farms because there's no one on the farms doing, you know, the backpackers jobs and they're getting paid well. So, it's like they're pulling from other industries. Yeah. And that's where we see this big shift and it's on the margin. And so, I guess what the implications for that are, maybe it turns around, it reverses pretty quick. Maybe. And we've always relied on immigration. So uh, while borders are open, they're not they're not flood people aren't flooding in like they have in, in previous years or for the last twenty years. Mm. I think if that reverses, well then you quickly see, you know, lower cost workers once again going into bars, going into cafes, going into restaurants, and then that mm. will obviously flow it back into other sectors, you'd think, mm. at some point. Shout out to Beneath Driver Lane here in <laughs> Victoria and Melbourne CBD. Very good bar if you can get in. Uh, it's pretty pretty exclusive this time of year, but it's a good bar if you want a, uh, a whiskey or a, or a rum or whatever takes your fancy. Disclose uh, my personal stake <laughs> business. <laughs> uh, no, it's a great spot, so um, get down there. Uh, okay, so we've done CSL, we've done BHP, Seek, good result. Um, the outlook is the thing that people are concerned about, which is fair enough. Um, one result I haven't looked at at all, mate, which is vicinity centers. Can you just tell, tell us what it does and what the result was? I think the easy way to summarize it is that it owns Chadston uh, and then a series of, I think it's the Emporium Arcade in Melbourne and a series of major shopping centers and then some regional shopping centers mm. as well. Chadston being the biggest shopping center in Victoria, the fashion capital, if you like. They've got a, their own bus line that goes from the, so I think from the CBD straight to, yep, Monique's yep. nodding here, <laughs> uh, straight to Chadston. So, um, big hub hub for everything and it's a hotel and stuff there now too yeah and it was you'd say on the headline it was a great result profit was up five times it went from a loss last year to a profit of 1.2 billion mm -hmm. like said a 500 percent gain in profit i'm not sure if you can call when it goes from a loss to a gain 500 percent. i always love that the yeah. negatives just spin it around it yeah. jumps it up uh essentially you're buying a company that the funds from operation is the most important thing. That's where your rental payments are coming in. Mm -hmm. That was up 7%. They pay out 95% of that as, as distributions. And then they create value or make money either by changing the rental mix, increasing rent. So some see it as an inflation hedge where you, your rent goes up at a retail store. Sometimes they have links to the profitability of, say, a Woolworths or a West mm -hmm. Farmers and their rent goes up when that goes up. Um, one of the big changes has been the valuation of their property. So, you know, do... During the pandemic, valuations went down, uh, traffic went down, cash, you know, cash receipts went down. They were quite strong, I think, in the media. Uh, yeah. I think it was with Solomon, maybe Premier Investments yeah, or one of those groups. On. Yeah. Uh, they were very strong in holding their position and not renegotiating too many uh, leases and kind of seeing through it all. Um, and the result was that over the 12 months, their net tangible asset value, so the value of the properties they own, went up 10% to $2.36. Mm -hmm. And I think that's about a 10 to 15% discount um, to the current uh, share price. No, it should be the opposite. Uh, share price um, is $2.03, basically. Yeah, so, so you're buying it at 10 to 15 You're buying the assets 10 to 15% cheaper than what they're currently valued at. Okay. Um, and I mean, all the trends in there were positive. They they haven't got a whole lot of gearing. They managed to negotiate their way through the pandemic reasonably well. Um, and one of the probably the interesting takeaways you might agree with, if you're a shopaholic and always out mm. and about, <laughs> um, it was healthcare maybe. The less visitation at malls or shopping centres, as we call them, is lower than it was pre-pandemic. But people are spending more money, and they're calling it like this more engaged or committed or um, I can't remember exactly what the word was shopper where you're going for a reason and you're spending everything at that time rather than going hmm. consistently so hmm. good for healthy retailers are good for healthy uh, yeah. shopping centers well i know there's a tesla store in chadston so yeah. if you're buying tesla it's going to increase your basket size a little bit i'm trying to <laughs> yeah wouldn't that be nice um yeah it's what do you what do you make of Interest rates going up though for REITs and property. They're actually coming down already. That's why all the property trusts have done well in the last yeah. uh, six weeks. As in like that's why they're like because the revaluation of those fixed rates are, are dropping. I think one thing, there's a few things to consider that. Yeah, generally a higher bond yield should eventually equate to a higher cap rate and a cap rate is what the key tool you use to determine the valuation of property. Um, so one thing is always understanding how the cap rates 
what cap rate levels are with these companies. Are they overly aggressive? You know, I think most of the properties in this portfolio valued about 5.25% yield. So yeah, right. they didn't get down to the one and a half, two percent yeah, that industrial properties were trading at. Um, so always understanding and where that sits compared to the market, which they're usually pretty good at sharing, how aggressively they're pricing, uh, they're pricing their properties. Um, naturally, you'd think there'd be some level of uh, reduction in value as bond yields, but it requires people to sell essentially. Mm. Uh, and if you re- if you're in a if you're holding high quality landmark assets, you're not having vacancies. Anyone that leaves is going to be quickly taken over. You're not discounting. Yeah. So that's the difference between this and and a kind of sub regional or lesser quality uh, shopping center strategy. Um, mm. I think it's a risk. Probably more on the gearing side. So how much of your uh, interest rate risk have you hedged out? Um, they've only got twenty five percent gearing, which is pretty that's pretty good, pretty low for yeah. a, a property uh, trust. Um, so make, making sure that if interest rates did go back to seven percent, you're not going to lose a massive amount of your your profit, which they've been pretty good at. Just on the um, Bloomberg government bonds here, ten year yield is down seven basis points over the past month. Um, so that's yeah, hinting. And I've so about three point one, three point two. 3.33. I've spoken to um, I spoke to Chris Bates, who's a mortgage broker on the show recently, and he actually said Macquarie and CBA actually dropped their fixed rates on mortgages yep. recently. So that we're starting to see that flow through to consumers as well. This is what people don't don't really look at. You hear in the newspaper that the you know the market is predicting interest rates to get to seven percent, and that's because the ten year bond yield went from 0.5 to four percent in about three months earlier yeah. this year, but it's since fallen from four back to 3.3. Mm. And the prediction isn't a set prediction like it sounds mm. like when you read the media. It's actually a constant review yep. of what's happening in the market. So you'd say the – and our view is that the expectations of interest rate hikes that that were priced into the market were excessive and it's, it's slowly right. coming back to normal. Yeah. You still get your um... – My interest rate on my mortgage is still going up. Yeah. That, and that could still happen as um... – as interest, if the RBA does increase interest rates, that could still happen. But it's the forward yields that we're looking at here. Like, what is the market pricing in in the future, basically? Um, okay, so overall, then it sounds like a pretty good result. Yeah, we we're pretty happy with it. This is a part of um, our model as well. So probably a B. Yeah, a B. Cool. What when you say it's part of the model? So do you have a few of these in there, or is this just one exposure? We generally have unlisted. Uh, property so. yeah. um, but then saw this similar in the back end of the pandemic so around the time the vaccine uh, was announced we had a few op- opportunities kind of recovery opportunities and we bought it back then okay um, yeah cool as a play on the reopening yeah I like it um, okay so that's vicinity I'll do one that uh, maybe I just uh, we'll do solo because I, I don't think you've looked at the company which is carsales.com um, really strong result so for those of you that don't uh, trade in used cars, um, used cars are actually going up, which is for the first time that I can remember. Um, used cars, if you have a used car, you could probably get more for it than you paid for it. Uh, and so what that means is it's a really good market for car sales, which is Australia's dominant um, car portal. Whether you're selling new or used, it's actually still the dominant portal. Uh, it really... The, the competition in the space, at least here in Australia and New Zealand markets, are, is pretty weak. Um, you've got Facebook Marketplace and you've got Gumtree that do free ads. Um, and those are fantastic for selling items, whether it's household items. But in terms of w- which companies actually target vehicles, there aren't that many. And no one at scale like car sales. So like Seek, these two companies kind of grew up beside each other. Uh, one in HR and one in automotive. And Car sales over time has just done basically the same thing that Seek's done, used its core operations to pay dividends, to continue to invest and grow, and then expand outside of its core competency over time into adjacencies. Done a really good job of that. Most recently, however, it's put its chips down for um, a company called Trader Interactive, which does RVs and power sports vehicles and um, the like over in the United States. So it's a massive step for the business. About 18 months ago, I don't have the exact figures in front of me, about 18 months ago, car sales made a bid for Trader Interactive and bought 49% of the company. And since then, it's gained more conviction in the business and then um, had to stump up an additional $1.2 billion Australian, I believe. Um, And that will give it the full 100% control. What I like about this deal is that they've gone into the US market in a way that is not the same as what like they haven't just gone okay we're going to do car sales 
USA yeah. because that would be hugely competitive. Instead, they've gone, well, the RV market is growing and power sports is growing and we are really good at automotive and we've done really good at what they call yields, which is just price increases. It's REA speak for price increases. <laughs> um, they've just, they're saying yields are up. Um, and so basically they've said, well, we'll take our know-how, our engineering, and we'll apply that to this market. It's a way to get in. But what I like about it is they didn't just go, we're just going to launch straight over there. They went and bought a company and they bought a part of it. And then they thought, okay, this is working. We've got good visibility. Now we'll buy the whole thing. Uh, some of the things that are really interesting about car sales, if you haven't been on there in a while, um, some of the things that they do recent that they tried to do recently is move into what's called instant offer, where if you've got a used car, you want to sell it. You don't want to go through the rigmarole of trying to find a buyer and have people kick your tires and everything. They, um, they'll make you an offer on your vehicle. There's a few. Obviously, there's an asterisk around that or a two. Um, but basically, they buy your car from you. And this this is, uh, I don't know if you are across this company, but in the US, Zillow um, does this with property. Yeah. Yeah. So- Did this. Did this, property. yeah. They started to <laughs> unwind that. Um, so basically, what these big digital platforms have said is, you know, we're making so much money from these ads- People can pay 50 bucks and get their car listed or a real estate agent can pay REA group, whatever. Um, but now they've gone, well, this is a big transaction. We could make so much more money and we've got the data to back up algorithms that could buy these assets and sell them and move into the physical away from just pure digital. And that's what most of them are trying to do. Um, I think it's better suited to cars than it is to oh, property yeah. like Zillow was doing, given yeah. the smaller ticket size and probably more granulate like a yeah. Honda from 1992s. Similar to Honda from 1992, but a yep. you know Edwardian <laughs> house in <laughs> yeah. in Fairfield is not that similar to the next Edwardian house in Fairfield. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, there's a lot more data on cars as well, right? Yeah. So, um, so they've tried to do that. Um, in terms of like results, all very strong. Revenue up 36 percent on a look through basis. EBITDA up 25, NPAT up 27. Um, reported basis, those figures are revenue 19 percent. EBITDA 12% and MPAT 23%. They've got a lot of equity accounted style things where they own bits of this and bits of that. Um, but for the most part, the core business is firing on all cylinders. I did not mean that pun, but there you have it. <laughs> is there you a risk that the, obviously used cars are doing well. Do they also do- Dealer. Yeah. yeah so is the, there a risk that, that yeah, that's so, been dragging, but- So what's been happening, which is interesting on the call, because the, the analysts were- Quite upbeat, I would say, but they will, and the car sales management team of like, they're very good. So, you know, they have about 10 of them on the call, this division head, that person from there. So you can ask whoever any question and they very, it's very good how they allow questions to this person that's based in South Korea. Yeah. Whereas other companies, it's like just a CFO, just the CEO answering questions. Um, and then I find it becomes very scripted and very like, this is like we're, we're guarding our secrets. But yeah. with these guys, it's very much like we'll answer the question. And so one of the analysts which said point, pointed out that, you know, well, what happens if, you know, the forward estimates, like things get a bit tougher. We're not going to see this, you know, Goldilocks kind of period for private cars. And so what's happening at the moment is used cars are getting like they're, they're just flying off the shelf, so to speak. And so what's happening is people are going to dealers and saying, hey, do you want to buy this? And the dealers are just lowballing them because yeah. they they know that like the people want to sell, but they know that they're going to move it on. They've got enough demand. They don't have to. They, they're just going, yeah, whatever. We'll give this. And then people are turning to um, private sales. But as things get tougher, the dealers might become more active and need to be more do more advertising. Might need to um, be on car sales more regularly to get their sales happening. Yeah. So it kind of has this counter cyclical element to it where. It, and even we could apply that to private sellers as well. If you're not selling your car as well next year, what are you going to do? It's not selling on Gumtree. It's not selling on Facebook. The deal is like so-so. Well, you go straight back onto car sales and you pay for the premium ad. Yeah. So it's got those counter cyclical elements where Seek probably doesn't have that as, as, as well. Yeah. Um, as well, it's got the optionality in Korea, Latin America, and now the USA. So um, not to be too bullish on the company, but- it was a good result. Dividends were good. Profit was good. Pretty strong outlook. Maybe that there's a risk there that it's not a Goldilocks period next year. But I think for the most part, good result. It looked great to me. I'm trying to buy a car at the moment and uh, just given up. Oh, honestly, yeah. <laughs> for I, 2023, I think. Yeah. I, so I gave up, to be honest, as well. Um, I was looking for a Subaru online and 
everything was so expensive, like five or 10 grand more than what you'd think that they would go for. Yeah. And ended up buying one down the road. <laughs> the guy just put a sign out. He's like, I'll get rid of this. I'm like, okay, I'll take it. <laughs> um, Should have been on car sales. <laughs> yeah. If, I reckon if he was on car sales, he would have sold it for two grand more. Yeah. But he was looking for a quick sale and I was happened to live on the street. <laughs> so that, that works for me. Um, so yeah, I mean, yeah, good outlook. Um, interesting move into the US, something to watch closely. Australian companies don't always have the best track record of moving into the US. So, um, yeah, it'll be, a, it'll be a good period to watch um, the business going forward. Uh, there's still some weakness around with COVID, by the way, too, in places like Mexico. So, um, it's not all roses for the business, but a good result. So, we've done a few names now, mate. What's next? I got Challenger. So, my okay. theme of fund managers, uh, yes. they're not just a fund manager. So, for people who don't know Challenger, it's a annuity provider. So, mm-hmm. they sell annuities for retirees, for institutions, essentially guaranteeing income for a certain period of time. Sounds um, like a Ponzi scheme. Go ahead. <laughs> it's more like an insurance company than a Ponzi scheme. Okay. <laughs> Very similar. <laughs> but uh, part of their business is obviously when you've got all that money, you manage it similar to Berkshire Hathaway. And uh, part of that is through, uh, they own a group called Fidante, which distributes, you're probably talking to some of their their managers. Um, I think it's groups like Bentham, Aries, a lot of fixed income and SIP uh, fund managers, so involved in credit and, and fixed income. Did sectors. you say SIP? CIP, yeah. Is that the name of the fund or is what is that? I think it meant it Challenger Investment Partners. I think it's oh, okay. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, so I think that was kind of their internal management. Yep. Uh, and they've got something like, or well, their group assets under management is was 99 billion. It fell 10% for the year, but that includes both the statutory fund they have to hold for their annuities and they call it life sales as well as the assets under management of external investors. Hmm. Uh, this is quite an inter- interesting one because everyone talks about insurance companies being beneficiaries of higher interest rates, but they're actually impacted by higher interest rates. So, their profit, normalized profit was up 19% to 472 million, but their statutory profit was down 57 percent to 254 million and that was because they had to mark to market their the fixed their, income their book essentially yeah yeah and, and if you're in insurance majority of your assets going to be fixed income property yeah lower risk less volatile and because bond yields were going up the value of those fell even if you can deploy new money at a mm-hmm. at a cheaper uh, valuation the assets that you already have so that was something like a two 170 million dollar hit from that portion um which hit profit and the share price went down 10% on the day. So, that was probably one of the biggest larger cap movers. I think it rallied 5 or 6% the day after. So, halfway it back did, yeah. to where it should be. Um, but looking, I think it's very cyclical. So, looking beyond that, the company is obviously positive because life annuities sold up 14% in sales to institutions. So, like pension funds, uh, which are now being forced to embrace this retirement income covenant. We're up 68% for the year. Uh, and most importantly for invest, the dividend was up 15%. So, that tells you, you know, the normalized profit they're comfortable with and the, the investment returns are kind of a, you know, a mark to market or looking through those towards the, the profitability of the company. Mm. I always thought Challenger could be a Ponzi scheme because- <laughs> I was just, I was like, how can they do something like guarantee a market return for so long when so many have gone before them and not been able to do that? I don't know. It's like a bank where you just guarantee a market return that's quite low. Yeah. And that's probably the challenge they've had for the last 10 years is it's difficult to buy annuities when the yield you're guaranteeing is like two and a half, three and a half percent. You, you just naturally don't want to guarantee that for 10 or 15 years. No. But now that that's increased with interest rates and bond yields, it becomes very attractive once again. Do, do you recommend annuities to your clients? Not at the moment. But just because of those? Because they're so Yeah, low. locking in at 2 to 3%, you didn't have any optionality. And if it was clear that rates were going to increase at some point in the next 10 years, it's difficult to do it at that time. But clearly, it's changing now. And if your view is that interest rates are flat for an extended period of time, well, annuities become attractive for a portion of portfolios because guarantee a basic level of income is yeah. kind of what everyone wants. So, the just in terms of the segment report, so this is like the different business units, um, normalized uh, profit, you could say, um, for the life business, that's the annuities business, was $472 million, as you said. And it's $83 million for the funds management business. Just to put it in context of how big they are, um, the life business is still the predominant business, but the funds management business is a natural 
growth driver for this Definitely. company because they can distribute. They're already speaking to people. Um, just find great fund managers, put them in the platform, basically plug and go. And they said one of the interesting ones was 98% of their assets under management, so the funds that they they distribute or, or run, are outperforming their benchmarks over hmm. three years. Interesting. So everything's outperforming that they own. A lot of it isn't in equities. It's obviously in fixed income markets. Fixed, yeah. yeah, definitely. So that was super interesting. Um, and what heading in the right what, direction. What benchmarks are you using? <laughs> <laughs> Don't look at me with my skeptical Well, that's for, the due, that's for the due diligence <laughs> questions, but it's the same question you should ask, definitely. Yeah. Cash, probably cash. Yeah, cash. <laughs> cash plus. Cash less inflation. Interesting. I mean, the one ex- unexpected thing was they bought a bank. I can't remember what the- My State Bank, maybe it was, maybe, two years yeah. ago. Makes sense. And they just said they're looking at getting rid of it, essentially, you know, really? reversing out of Challenger Bank. Because um, that's a very small part of their business. Yeah, and it has capital requirements, and then you, I think they reported a net interest margin of ninety three basis points. So it's hard to make money on a net interest margin of ninety three basis points. What the earth it is, yeah. yeah. So not worth the hassle when you've got two businesses that are already very like very good. Like the funds management business isn't market leading, but it's growing. That's very impressive, and then the life business is market leading. So why would you kind of? distract yourself with something else. The market seemed to think it was an F, but I kind of saw it as more of a <laughs> what, C it, or a B. It um, fell pretty pretty much at the open, didn't it? It fell 12%, but yeah, it's- right. um, It's come back a bit. It fell to a low of seven, $6.07 seven and it's back up to six dollars Six seventy already. Yeah, so um, if you're shrewd enough to make your entrance at that point, good on you. Um, so, okay, it, it keeps rolling on. It keeps building Challenger. So, there you go. Um, really interesting one, very popular for its dividend yield. It's, I, personally, I'd rather own like a diversified ETF to get my dividend yield, but I think um, it's market leader in what it does. So, yeah, let it roll on. I think it's good getting diversification of income for when like a lot of portfolios at the moment, we talk about BHP and the banks yeah. getting diverse sources away from that even if it's still in finance yeah definitely yeah, good point um so i think we're left with one uh and one only which uh i'll start with <laughs> soon that i recommended this company and i have a lot of regrets about it which is our red bubble so i'll summarize it not very good results um this, i think market was expecting weak results the company had guided down anyway out of covid uh and they still probably People were still probably caught off guard, hence the 31% share price fall, I think it was on the day. Um, so what does Redbubble do? Redbubble is a, an e-commerce website. You can go there and you can get um, designs of your some, sometimes your favorite brands or sometimes it could be things just like quirky little things that you get on the on your iPhone case or your your favorite mug or you know travel mug or something like this or a t-shirt. I think there's there's a there's a new section on there called Pets. Where you can get like a scarf for your dog. Um, so you can do all this sort of stuff. Who are its competitors? Its competitors are probably Etsy on one side, Etsy being the big US company. Um, I actually looked at Etsy's results for the most recent quarter and the marketplace revenue was down. So I think that's worth highlighting is that the biggest gorilla in the industry also reported some weaker results um, and they also had to spend more for employment. Uh, that's Etsy. Um, and on the other side, there are other brands like indie brands and so on and so forth. So why do people use Redbubble? Well, artists go to Redbubble because they can upload the designs. And it basically means that they don't have to pack, fulfill, send, and redesign every design that they create. So if you have a design and it's like in a PNG file, like an image format, you can upload it to Redbubble and someone else can go along and use it on a mug or a pillowcase or whatever. And Redbubble will pay you if that design ever gets used. So that's as simple as it is. Um, and that's why people like it. So in terms of marketplace revenue, um, for the full year down 13%, gross profit down 18%. They spent 7% more on customer acquisition um, at I think $76 million. Uh, in terms of operating EBITDA, down 106%. So this is one of those ones that went from positive to negative, it went from positive 63 million to negative 3.6. Um, EBIT, which is earnings before interest and tax, otherwise known as operating income, fell from $39 million to negative $22 million. So a huge reversal across the major metrics for the company. Which I think they flagged a year or two ago as well. Yeah. Because so during COVID, um, masks made up a, a healthy chunk of the sales. If you wanted a mask, but you didn't want to just wear the standard blue one or 
You didn't want to wear the black one that your grandma had knitted for you. Um, you could go to Redbubble and you could get one with, I don't know, maybe not Homer Simpson, but something funny on it. And you could get a mask like that. Um, and so I, Kev, our old analyst, had one with the, the, the meme where there's like the little guy sitting in a burning down house. And he's like, this is fine. Um, that was his mask. That was, I really like that. So, you know, this uh, business is an interesting business in that it's trying to allow creators and designers to make money from their assets. Um, it's a tough industry though, because on one hand, they need to be fed from Google and ads. And on the other hand, they've got fulfillment expenses. Yeah. So my original thesis for Redbubble was it's starting to get traction. People are growing awareness of it. You know, COVID was a good thing. I thought some of those artists and some of those consumers would hang around. Like once you try Redbubble, you get familiar with it, you like it, you keep going. Um, and over time, the business would scale well. And then once it scales, basically what they call fulfillers, which are manufacturing sites that produce the t-shirts and produce this and ship it to customers and whatever, they would be able to go back to them and say, hey, we're going to, we want more. We're going to wear the platform. You guys are commoditized. We've got, if you don't take our cost base for this t-shirt, we're just going to find the next manufacturing site that will take 20 million t-shirts over the next year and do it for less. And that basically hasn't happened. So Redbubble was a scale game and all of a sudden it's turned around. It was like our version of a NASDAQ stock, essentially. Yeah. That yeah. It was seeking to get uh, this kind of low margin business. You need to get scale, you need volume and you need it quickly. Yep. And then when the market turns, valuation, the valuation you got, the cash you've got are all challenged. Yep. Um, I think the concept makes sense. Uh, the only thing you look on the website and you probably think maybe too many verticals. Like can you imagine having to deliver <laughs> everything from homewares to T-shirts to masks? Mm. Um, maybe that's where they go next. But you could get, if you're on a Redbubble right now, you could get a I'm Rask on. branded um, oh, you're on there. I, I created a fake account, you know, like a dummy account. But I think you can actually order some. And it's horrible because I made it and everyone on the team was like, oh, don't show that. Maybe it's deleted now. I don't know. Maybe they like- They banned you. <laughs> <laughs> just got rid of it because like, this is ugly. Um, but you could get a RAS branded shower curtain and then you could go into the lounge room and get a RAS branded <laughs> pillowcase. Take it. Take your phone with you while well, there's a RAS branded <laughs> phone case. Um, so you could do that. Um but yeah, you're right. Like they have done a lot of verticals and the verticals have promised more. But at the end of the day, I, personally, I don't think it's that. Personally, I think it's are people using it. Yeah. And are artists saying when they've got their Instagram profile or when they've got their website, are they saying buy it on Redbubble? That's the network effect. Just like, you know, with Amazon Pay, uh, no, sorry, Amazon a Afterpay, it was like paying for with Afterpay. Just having the logo on the website meant that everyone was like, oh, well, Afterpay, what's, what's that thing? I'll go check that out. Yeah. I don't know if we've had that with Redbubble yet. Um, I think the management team are great. Maybe I'm a bit smitten by them, but they're honestly, I think they, they speak really well internationally. Um, I guess they're, they're qualified for the role. So I think um, it's actually Seek Connection too with Michael, um, the CEO. So I think, it's a, I think it's a hard industry at the moment, particularly cycling off of COVID. Um, now I'm a bit hesitant in terms of trying to value the business. In the past, I found it a little bit, I was a bit more comfortable. But with fulfiller expenses and inflation hitting supply chains, and on the other side, they're still spending acquisition to get acquisitions. Um, I just find it a bit, it's, it's, it's well, very Cash burn but, becomes a problem, doesn't it? If yeah. they got 89 million in cash left, yeah. eventually you have to raise capital. How dilutive does that capital raising become if you're still trying to- you know, yeah. pursue your your strategic goals. Um, the, I think listening to another podcast. Um, you listen to another podcast? I do. <laughs> I can't hear my own voice. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think one of the challenges you have is a lot of these tech companies that have fallen 60, 70, 80%, there's a risk that they get bought by someone who can leverage them and get give yeah. them more scale. And that doesn't happen at the $7 that they hit no. five years ago, three years ago. It's more likely they're getting it at a discount and around the current price. Not saying they'll be taken over, but it seems like what might happen for the quality businesses. And they do have a reasonably good model, it, it seems. Yeah. And the, the t so, I just was checking via third-party websites, like checking things like website rankings and all that. And it's still, you know, still up there. intact. I can and buy you a sticker for $1.57. Did you um, find it? $1.57. Yeah. yeah. Probably not worth that, to be honest. <laughs> um, if you did print it, uh, let me know the quality. Uh, so, 
the thing is, I, I, I think it's 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 in a t- difficult spot. And when a company's in a position where there's a the the, the head the tailwinds have just become a dr- dramatic um, headwind, management need to make some pretty hard choices typically. And typically, the companies that do well, the companies that make the hard choices earlier on. At least that's what I've found. Like they make the they make the decision. We've got to do this because things aren't as good as they were. Um, and sometimes you need to change your your strategy. Um, I think, like I said, I think the management team is really good. The thing that they have with that cash balance, which I was looking at too, is that in the second half of the year, when we get the results like we did just now. The cash flow, still people haven't quite worked this out. But if you, uh, in the lead up to Christmas is obviously the busy time. And because they're collecting the cash from the customers up front, kind of like Amazon, and then they're paying the fulfillers 30 days later or whatever it is, at December 31, their cash flow looks really good. And in the second half of the year, it looks like a dog's breakfast because then all of a sudden they've had to pay out all that cash. Yeah. And so that's what we tend to get, that shock and awe in the second half. And I think we just got dealt that blow. I mean, it's covered by less analysts, if if any. So, that's probably where the struggle comes from too. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, I think the business has just got to be managed. I, I mean, I'm not telling them how to run their business. I don't know it as well as they do, but um, it's just now for investor expectations, it's just got to be managed to, yeah, we're going to survive and here's their plan. Um, yeah, I think it's still a $400 million business and um, I think it's still got really good assets. Um, yeah, there are some things about it that are pretty tough, but um, I, I really like, yeah, again, really like management team. So we'll see. I, I'm looking forward to seeing how that one plays. I don't own shares in it, by the way, anymore. So, um, and we told our members to sell a little while ago, which I'm thankful for. So, mate, that's all of the companies. We've got Redbubble in reverse. We've got car sales. We've got vicinity centers. We did Seek, BHP, CSL. Did I miss any? Challenger. 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 How can I forget Challenger? Um, so some really good names there. If you do want to send us an email. I did get some messages through uh, via Twitter. There is actually going to be a link in this week's show notes and it'll go to a type form. So that's just like a, a form that you can fill out anonymously. It asks you to send us your questions uh, depending on which RAS podcast you listen to. You can get in touch with Drew, wattlepartners.com.au. Link will be in the show notes forward slash contact. Um, and you can find out more about Waddle Partners financial planning there. We're also, even though we talked about Seek and Drew owning Seek, we are also on LinkedIn. Um, so if you do need to reach out, you can reach out that way. But if you do have a question, send it through the type form. We will ask you some questions um, as part of a survey as well while we do that. But it's completely anonymous. So go and check that out. We'll be coming back next week with more companies. Hopefully we'll have 10. I think we'll <laughs> seven was a good sure number. I feel like seven's like a secret number in podcasts. It might be like you put seven in the title. Like People at fine dining, some, you always have an odd number yeah, rather than an even number. Yeah, yeah. something maybe there's some science behind this we're about to discover. Agile. That's what we are here at the podcast. So uh, Drew Meredith, Water Partners, thanks for joining me. Thanks again.